it is better afterwards. There will be room for questions in the middle, so there will be a designated uh, spot in the middle of the presentation for questions. OK, thanks. OK, Jie, uh, the floor is yours. OK, thank you, Arkady, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining my presentation. You can all see my slides, right? Just to confirm. Yes. OK, cool, cool. Um, OK, let me uh, start by briefly uh, describing my uh, my research background, also to explain a bit how I reached to this uh, current uh, research topic that I'm going to introduce next. So I did my PhD in uh, until that uh, here, and the topic was about understanding and leveraging human intelligence in data or knowledge creation processes. And an important application that you can imagine is, of course, creating training data for machine learning systems. Uh, but during my PhD, I was mainly focused on the human side of the research, studying relevant human characteristics such as expertise and motivation. Um, and then in my postdoc, I started to focus a lot on uh, integrating human and machine intelligence, for example, how to best allow machine learning models to, to actually learn from humans so that you know, we can save uh, some effort in, uh, uh, in the labeling while addressing issues in human data creation, for example, uh, reliability and biases uh, uh, of this data uh, annotated by, by humans. So afterwards, I spent some time in industry working as a machine learning scientist at Amazon based in uh, Seattle. Uh, what I did there was mainly applying my research outcomes to, uh, to personalized search and recommendation on voice, you know, those Alexa devices, which most of the time uh, disappoint you. <laughs> Um, and that, by the way, involves a lot of natural language processing, which I'm currently also teaching at the every faculty. So now I will uh, start to uh, introduce this uh, exciting project I'm currently working on called ARC. The idea is to develop a, a, a diagnosis tool that would allow us to know what a machine learning system doesn't know. So. Uh, why are we uh, interested in this topic? Well, this is mainly driven by the fact that machine learning systems currently are running everywhere, right? But in a very unreliable way, and they generate errors uh, which we don't really expect in many situations. I believe most of us have seen or have heard those terrible stories of machine learning errors in, for example, in many types of mission critical tasks, including, for example, transport, finance, and healthcare, uh, where safety is a very, very important concern. It is, it is also a very big problem in other uh, applications, such as those information services, uh, which nowadays uh, shape people's uh, people's opinion uh, to a very to a very large extent, right? So the challenge here is that we don't really know we don't know much about how to build a system that you know, can behave in a reliable manner that, you know, can really help us uh, uh, to be, to become less worried about all those uh, catastrophic damaging uh, effects. So what are the pain points here? Well, let's take a look at uh, machine learning systems uh, life cycle. Huh? A typical machine learning system life cycle would generally involve two types of uh, stakeholders, the developers who sometimes are called uh, machine learning scientists or engineer and the user or domain experts. Right? This, is of, this is of course very much simplified. Uh, for example, in the hospital case, domain experts or users could be the doctors and could also be those people who are affected by the use of the machine learning systems. For example, those uh, patients uh, and their families, right? Who are affected by the by the use of, for example, those auto aut automatic uh, diagnosis uh, uh, tools. Um, but I want to highlight th highlight those two types of stakeholders um, because they are really representative of the problems that we are going to talk about. So the problems with this current machine learning life cycle is that when the system fails, the user can well they can provide feedback to the machine learning developer. But the developer wouldn't know what to do uh, to to fix the systems such that similar errors won't happen again in the future. And from the user's perspective, it's really hard for them to know 
what's going wrong, right? And how much they should trust the model. So basically what we need in this case is a diagnosis tool that can help us to, to uh, debug the system that can help us to know what is really going wrong, right? Why is, an, why is the error happening? Thereby allowing us to avoid similar errors or new errors as much as possible, right? So this kind of tool is essential. If you think about it, it's essential to build any type of reliable systems, being them software or hardware. We cannot really build a perfectly reliable system in one shot, right? But it's more an incremental process that involves a lot of testing and debugging. And having such a tool would help us really to close the loop and allow uh, for such incremental improvement of the system. Now I've been mainly talking about the importance from the developer's perspective, right? But other than that, knowing the machine, knowing what the machine doesn't know is actually super important also from the user's perspective. Now, it helps them to decide when to trust the system. Uh, and, and it can help uh, it can help all the people to better work with AI algorithm, knowing what what are the things that an AI algorithm can do and cannot do, right? So to sum up a bit, having such a diagnosis tool is very important for different stakeholders. But in machine learning, we don't yet have this kind of tools. And this is partially because that, well, machine learning is still kind of new to many domains, right? And partly also because the problem of machine learning diagnosis is relatively hard, that needs a lot of research. And next, I will very briefly uh, give an intuition of why this is hard. Huh? So to understand, and the, uh, uh, to understand that, um, what we're actually asking here is, okay, what causes machine learning errors, right? And only by knowing that, we can develop this, uh, we can start to develop those uh, those tools for the purpose of diagnosis of machine learning systems, right? So what causes machine learning errors? Uh, well, those errors generally come from biases in the data, in data selection, representation, and in annotation, right? This is different from uh, the cases with uh, software systems, if you think about it, right? Software systems usually come with a lot of code, not that much data, but then in machine learning, um, well, what's most complex is those patterns hidden in the data, right? And, and, and in comparison to that, in comparison to that, the code that we use to build machine learning systems are relatively simple, right? It's almost the same, same thing that we do to to you know really to program a machine learning system for different tasks right we follow the same uh, 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 recipe yeah? uh, well creating the features building a model and then test the model right but then what's complex here is what's hidden in the data uh, and to to really see that let's consider a simple but illustrative example. Huh? Let's say our goal now is to train a machine learning model to classify if an image is about a dog or a cat, a very typical uh, uh, division task. So now assume that the training data only contains images of black dogs and white cats. And then and if we train a machine learning model on this training data, what it will learn would simply be okay, we can uh, uh, discriminate perfectly dogs and cats, right? Solely based on their color, regardless of any other, you know, genuinely uh, discriminative features, such as, for example, a shape of nose, color of eyes, right? So if we train a model like this, let's say we deploy the model, right? Then if, we, if the model now sees an image with a white dog, what it will do will be, okay, it will very confidently classify the image as a, as a cat based on the color, right? Because it learns that, okay, color is very indicative of, uh, of, uh, of the class of the image. Mm -hmm. So this example shows, well, despite being very simple, right? It shows that the intrinsic problem with machine learning systems, that is they learn from the data by picking up those st statistical correlations. For example, the correlation between the color and the animal. Right, and those correlations are not really reliable. And the example might be very, uh, again, very simple, right? But it can happen with a much bigger uh, 
uh, implication depending on where the application is uh, is uh, is the uh, 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 where the application is, right? Uh, for example, uh, imagine now the goal is to predict who is more likely to uh, recommit crimes uh, in the legal uh, system. And the bias now is human race, right? So just like color for dog and cat classification, in this case, the bias, uh, this what we call actually uh, spurious correlations, uh, that the color indicates uh, uh, the class, right? And here the color is race, right? It comes with a much bigger uh, implication. And similar problem can also happen in other uh, uh, critical scenarios, for example, in medical cases, right? For example, if our goal is now to predict uh, if or not a medical image contains cancer, right? And predicting a cancer to be, for example, a benign tumor based on irrelevant features could lead to a uh, well, damaging effect. Now, this kind of bias is lead to a major type of machine learning errors that we call uh, unknown unknowns, which are errors produced with very high confidence. And as, as I already uh, described, right, those kind of errors can lead to catastrophic, uh, catastrophic uh, 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 with, uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, if you actually, if you think about it, right, it's, it's fine to make errors as long as the model can tell that it is not confident, right? And in that case, humans can take over the decision making. But when the model says it's confident, well, the prediction better be correct. This kind of error is, is really hard to identify before we observe the damage, right? For example, all those methods uh, developed for proactive ident identification of machine learning errors such as active learning method can only deal with uh, the other type of error that we call known unknowns, right? Those errors that the model has low confidence in prediction. Uh, and then on a side note, I would, I would like to mention that we're currently working on an approach that uh, would allow active learning to be aware of those biases in the data. And we're developing a, a reinforcement learning based approach with humans in the loop such that uh, during active learning, we look not only at model confidence, but also look at the diversity of the data uh, so that the model in the end will be uh, more aware of things that it doesn't know. So coming back to the story, um, one thing I would like to point out is that uh, data alone might not be a solution. But this is what we are currently doing in practice, right? What we do now is that, okay, to avoid the, uh, those errors as much as possible, we collect as much as, as, as much data as possible, right? With the hope that the machine will be reliable in application. But it turns out that this is not really a good solution. We have seen that machine learning models trained on even huge data sets can still easily fail at uh, different applications. And this is a case in both uh, vision and the language tasks. For example, models trained on uh, image nets with 14 millions of images can still make all those errors that from our human's perspective is rather rather stupid, right? And this is the exact words people have been using uh, uh, in, the, in the academic uh, world, stupid. <laughs> um, and it's the same case with uh, large uh, language models like GPT-3, right, which is trained on hundreds of billions of words, but still people find that those models fail easily at uh, uh, those reasoning tasks that we humans see as quite uh, uh, simple. So instead of collecting more data, what we need to know is that, well, Ideally, we should know what data the system will see in application, right, and have them covered in the training data. The problem is that we cannot really, uh, uh, we cannot really uh, foresee all different application application scenarios, right? Eh? And that's the reason why we want to, you know, partly the reason why we want to use machine learning that to do all these uh, 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 intelligent tasks for us, right? So, but well, that is true. But at least. So here's my main proposition of the of the research uh, topic. So at least for anything that we know that machine learning systems should know, we should be able to know what it really knows and what it doesn't know. So once we know what the machine learning model doesn't know, 
we can not only fix errors when they occur, but also identify you know, foreseeable errors in the future and take actions to hedge the risks. Um, now, one thing that I have not mentioned intentionally uh, in my previous uh, 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 speech is, that is, is, is what we mean by us knowing something or by the machine knowing something. And that is a key consideration, actually, also a key challenge in developing a machine learning diagnosis tool. So when we say that a machine knows something, what we mean is you know, those correlations captured by the model represented by matrices and vectors, right? Filled with numerical numbers that are hard for humans to understand. On the other hand, when we say that, okay, we as humans uh, knowing something, we mean that those knowledge uh, represented by uh, symbolic concepts, relations and rules, right? This is how we humans understand the world through all those symbolic concepts. And note that those concepts, rules, they are usually more reliable because uh, especially the rules, right? They denote a causal relations as compared to those statistical correlations captured by the machine learning models. So with this in mind, um, our, our, this, our tool ARC is built with the following pillars. So first of all, to it, uh, uh, it allows us to know what a machine learning system knows uh, through some explainability method. Uh, and then we specify uh, our requirements of the domain knowledge that needs to be internalized in a machine. And this is key to ensure that the machine will behave reliably in the foreseeable situations, right? And then the last part is that, well, given what the machine knows, what we uh, what we know about the machine knows, that's rather complex. And given that what we know that the machine should know, we would like to infer what the machine doesn't know, right? So in the following, I'm going to very quickly go through uh, uh, works that we're currently doing in those different uh, subtopics. And then I will dive into uh, the first uh, topic, how do we know the machine, what the machine knows? Right, by presenting a, uh, a recent work that we published at the web, the web conference. Okay, so very quickly, um, about the, the, first, the first pillar, right? How do we know what the machine knows? This, as a, again, this is about uh, machine learning interpretability or explainability, which is currently quite popular everywhere, right? So, uh, as I said, right, we recently published a work that introduces a human in the loop approach to explain what the model has learned, and that I will uh, give more details uh, uh, in the second part of this presentation. So, essentially, what we did is uh, asking humans to annotate the concept that the model relies on in making the prediction. So, with this method, users can debug a system by looking at what classes the model is most you know, confused about. Right, and then identify those concepts and rules that the model relies uh, relies on in making those problematic uh, predictions. Now, for the second uh, uh, subtopic, uh, in terms of uh, how do we know what the machine should know, right? This is what we call requirement elicitation for machine learning tasks. So uh, here, what we need is to invoke domain experts or other types of users that can tell us their expectation of what the model should know, right? And then here to make the fun, we are developing games that can engage domain experts to contribute the knowledge. Uh, because here we are really dealing with people, right? It's important to, to make the task a enjoyable task. Uh, uh, well, in the, in the meanwhile, we're developing a language that uh, such that those requirements can be well specified for diagnosis purposes. Uh, this is still an, ongo on, an ongoing work. But I I like to share some uh, well reference numbers to show how big potential this could have uh, for machine learning uh, diagnosis. So there is a, currently a team in uh, Stanford which, uh, that recently uh, showed that well by testing machine learning systems against some uh, uh, predefined requirements we can largely reduce the errors. And what they did is to uh, is testing this uh, uh, this idea in the uh, uh, object recognition task. Uh, so 
it's so you can consider this. Uh, so what I show in the in the on the slide now is uh, uh, is a task of recognizing what's in a video, right? In a sequence of images in a video, and the goal here is to detect whether or not there is a car present uh, in those images. So the the requirement that they test is very simple. Let's say we let's say the model have have seen a car at a car at time t times time t, right? And a car at time t plus two, yeah? and then the model should already also see a car at time t plus one, right? In the middle, because it's not likely that the car will disappear uh, 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 and then come back in consecutive seconds, right? So this the, uh, uh, this kind of very simple uh, requirement, and they show that if we can, you know, test the 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 uh, uh, test and improve the machine learning systems against those requirements, then we can largely reduce the error of of object detection by up to uh, forty percent. Note though that what they did is only to test the model output again model outputs uh, against the 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 requirements. And what we are doing is something that is even deeper, right? We want to go into those systems, op open them up, and see what it has learned internally instead of uh, test, uh, uh, in, in, instead of uh, 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 posing requirements on the on the output of the model. Rather, we want to uh, uh, pose our requirements uh, uh, for those uh, knowledge that is learned inside the system, right? And this would allow us to uh, avoid more similar types of errors if you think about think about it right in the future mm -hmm. um, and another difference is that instead of uh, simply adding some constraint that anyone can come up with right what we're doing is well we're coming up with an approach that can allow us well first of all can allow us to elicit those uh, uh, requirements in a, in a very principled manner and also developing an, an approach that would uh, infer what's really going wrong in the model right and, and, and that's something that I'm going to uh, uh, introduce now. So this is related to the third topic. Um, so basically our goal here is to really to infer what the model doesn't know from the observation of what a, a, the model should know and what it already knows. This might sound very simple to you, right? But then uh, in the end, it's, it's not that simple, especially when we consider all those different relations between you know all the concepts that the model should should learn uh, internally. Yeah? So there are all those relations that need to be dealt with. Uh, that is why we uh, look at reasoning approaches. And there and and for this specific problem, uh, uh, this is not uh, uh, the usual type of uh, uh, deductive or inductive reasoning that we encounter in most cases. But rather, it's 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 related to a specific type of reasoning that we call abductive reasoning where the goal is to infer from observations to explanations, right? And here our observation is what the model should know and what it already knows. And the explanation is what it doesn't know, right? So on the slide is a project that we are currently working on with uh, the Freiburg Hospital in uh, Switzerland, my former colleagues, in the context of uh, uh, prostate cancer detection. So here we basically apply the same idea, right? We develop, we have already developed a machine learning model for automatic uh, cancer detection. And then given the requirements collected from the doctors and uh, also annotations from the crowds about what the model has learned, uh, we want to infer what the model doesn't know, right? Um, well, one of the key challenges here is that the, is that the requirement that we get from the, from the uh, requirement elicitation step might not be perfect, right? So we would need to involve again domain experts in the reasoning when, they, when it's uncertain. So we need an approach what that we call abductive reasoning and centered around humans, and that that is why we named the tool uh, Arc. Okay, this concludes my first part of the presentation. Um, I, let me quickly share with you some of the uh, some of the applications apart from this uh, prostate cancer case. So uh, in the legal domain, we're working with a data scientist data science team from the uh, our Ministry of Water and the Infrastructure Management who are using machine learning to detect the compliance of, of all those vehicles and shapes, right? So in their case, data is also biased. You can imagine that inspectors um, 
have a higher tendency of inspecting certain types of uh, trucks, for example, those trucks that uh, might look overweighted, right? So how can we ensure reliability and fairness when the when the training data is biased in this way, right? And then in the financial domain, we're working with banks where machine learning is used a lot to detect fraudulent uh, uh, transactions, for example, uh, money laundering, right? So how can we do, uh, uh, how can we make sure also the, the machine learning uh, models and predictions to be reliable in this case? And other than that, we are uh, we are also uh, uh, developing uh, solutions to ensure reliability of machine learning in the embedded AI uh, scenarios uh, in application to uh, smart buildings and factories. Right. This is rather in this is actually very interesting. We're currently working on a project that uh, uh, that tries to combine uh, sensors and AI that would allow us to uh, uh, to detect what people. Uh, draw in the air, right? All those digits, one, two, three, four, five, that people draw in the air, and this could be very useful. For example, for the uh, well, for the, for the buildings uh, in the elevators, right? When the you when the user want to go to uh, when people want to go to a certain floor, right? He or she wouldn't need again to uh, to press those buttons. Uh, they can simply uh, draw those numbers uh, in the air, and then with the sensing and AI, we can detect what's uh, what's going on, right? What do you what do the people where the where the people want to go, right? And this is very important today uh, in the in the corona in the COVID uh, context, right? Um, and there are all kinds of reliability problems there as well. For example, you know, people might have different habits uh, during uh, uh, different uh, during the same uh, digits in different ways, right? This might also depend on the educational background or cultural uh, background. Okay, I will stop here and uh, to uh, and take questions for this part. If you have questions, you can simply uh, maybe directly ask through the chat. Through voice or chat. Are there any questions? Uh, there is actually one from uh, Fokert in the chat. Um, so the question is that often we do not know what the machine must know because we're not aware of a lot of knowledge we have. A lot of this knowledge has not been consciously being putting in symbols either. How do you deal with this? That's actually a, a, a very, very relevant question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Forkert. Um, yes, indeed, indeed. So, mm, indeed, this is related to a lot of uh, work going on in uh, knowledge reputation and reasoning, right, which our group is also heavily uh, working on. So, uh, you're right that uh, it, there are a lot of knowledge, maybe most of the knowledge that we humans use for many different tasks, right? They remain in our in our brain, in our mind, in this biological neural network, right? Uh, yes. uh, and we cannot easily find them on the web or in some existing databases. So there is a lot of work that still needs to be done to, uh, you know, really uh, effectively extract those knowledge that people that we rely on to uh, to do those uh, daily, uh, uh, to uh, to do all those tasks on a daily basis, right? And and that is related to okay, uh, 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 related a lot to this uh, uh, approach that we call uh, human computation crowdsourcing, which is also uh, one, the, which is also my main uh, focus. It's a subfield of uh, of uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Well, not a lot of people are working on that, but it's getting quite uh, quite popular. The whole idea there is is to develop a uh, uh, develop solutions that would allow us to uh, efficiently well to to engage people, right? So that we can uh, 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 effectively obtain all those knowledge, for example. And it's not only about knowledge, right? But also, for example, beliefs, values, uh, those uh, those mm -hmm. things that we care a lot about nowadays, right? How to mm -hmm. get those things from from people to elicit to, uh, from from by uh, by actively engaging uh, people to contribute those uh, those things that we, uh, we want to have. Does that answer your question? Uh, well, it's it, it, uh, uh, 
to uh, confirm that we do not really have the, the final solution to this question indeed. Um, I, I uh, thank you for your presentation in the first, uh, uh, I want to say as well. And I'm very glad that you are aware of uh, that, that you try to make um, human knowledge available for uh, machines, a special uh, causal models, because I think that if we find a way to, um, to codify causal models we have, then you can as well cater for, um, um, for outliers, for exceptions, because uh, that's exactly what you said. If the machine is very sure, then we have no reason to doubt it. But if the machine says, well, this is not, this does not fit in my causal model, that, that can be another flag of saying, I'm not sure. And uh, this, uh, if, if you just start doing this, and you will find the, the errors will, will show us where we did not uh, formulate causal relations that we need uh, apparently in practice. Mm. Yeah, it has a lot to do with this causal uh, uh, relations. But on the other hand, it's also uh, uh, very much relevant to uh, uh, really to uh, uh, find ways to to engage with those different types of stakeholders, right? Uh, you can imagine that all those expectations, uh, they are, they are, I mean, they exist uh, in different uh, stakeholders' mind, right? So we need to find a way to yes. uh, uh, to actively engage them so that we really, uh, we can really be uh, well informed about uh, how the model should behave. Uh, there is another question from uh, Stefan that asks, how are you approaching the challenge of capturing what the model knows and symbolic concept that users are familiar with or are sufficiently abstract? That's a great question. That's uh, exactly the, the, uh, the work that I'm going to introduce uh, now. So, <laughs> good. Well, uh, uh, Stefan, uh, uh, tell me if uh, if you uh, think my presentation next is uh, really an answer to your question. Um, so, um, so what I'm going to uh, to introduce now is a recent work that we published at uh, the web conference. And very recent. I don't know if uh, the the uh, paper is already online. Maybe not yet. But if you're interested, uh, just uh, uh, let me know. Um, so. Uh, in this work, we develop a method for interpreting the internal uh, uh, concepts or mechanisms of, uh, of computer vision models by leveraging human computation at scale uh, through, through crowdsourcing. Uh, as you can see already, right, from the title that, okay, the way that we make something interpretable is really to, uh, interpretable to humans is really to engage humans in the process of interpreting those uh, uh, those things that we are interested in, right? Model behaviors, what it has learned, uh, concept and rules. Um, well, this I have already talked about uh, uh, very, very briefly. So why do we need uh, interpretability? Uh, we have talked about earlier uh, uh, from the uh, reliability and trustworthy perspective, right? right? So here is a more extensive list of, uh, of reasons. Uh, apart from uh, uh, being helpful for our developers to debug uh, models of interest, right? Explanation could also help them, uh, help those developers or data scientists to gain buy-in from customers, right? Or management, if uh, the customers are well aware of, uh, well, what the model can and cannot do, right? And then it's also, well, very important for auditors uh, to decide if the model is eligible to be deployed or not. And uh, this is uh, getting more uh, important given all those uh, new regulations about, uh, about AI, right? So uh, when we talk about interpretability, there are two types of uh, interpretability that uh, we're interested in, uh, local interpretability and global, right? Local interpretability means that we want to know uh, uh, the inference that the model uses for a specific prediction, if it makes sense, right? Uh, well, not necessarily if it makes sense, but yeah, we, we want to know uh, uh, the, 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 the inference that the model follows, right, in making predictions for specific uh, data instances. And then global interpretability means that we want to know what are the mechanisms that the model uh, has learned in general. And uh, here we mainly look at the computer vision. And in this context, global explainability or interpretability means that, okay, we want to know what uh, uh, 
I would explain the model behavior with, with respect to uh, uh, the predictions that it has for a set of images, right? For a data set. And all those global interpretability methods, uh, well, there are actually a lot of uh, 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 global interpretability methods, and uh, one of the most state-of-the-art uh, state type of this kind of method is that this uh, that they will uh, in those methods that will generate a video concept uh, that represent what the model knows, right? To uh, uh, to explain the behavior. So on the slides. Uh, output of uh, uh, the interpretability, interpretability method uh, published very recently that explains uh, model behaviors in the context of uh, uh, vehicle classification. So you can see that what it does is that those interpretability methods, right, it generates a set of concepts that the model looks at in making predictions, and each of those concepts is represented by a set of image patches, right, image patches. Now, on the slide, each of those, uh, 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 so all the image patches corresponding to one concept is organized at one individual row, right? So, for example, this row on the on this row on the top says that the model recognizes all those white uh, uh, patches uh, when the model is recognizing something as a moving van, right? And those white patches are likely to indicate the body of the, the car body of, of the lens. Huh? And, and there are other similar concepts as well. For example, logo, right? Uh, here you can see all different kinds of logos um, that are present in all those different uh, vehicles, right? But then I, I, I add question mark uh, next to each of those concepts because I imagine you may have already uh, uh, felt, right? It's relatively hard to really attach a semantic meaning. Uh, you need to uh, use a lot of effort, right? And this is the, uh, even if we zoom in, huh? so um, here what I did is I zoom in, uh, 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 to those image patches, find out by the model that uh, you know those image patches that are supposedly should represent one concept, right? One distinct concept. Concept. And what you can see here is something that is uh, relatively uh, ambiguous, right? It looks at okay, uh, well it could be uh, the 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 tier of uh, of the of the vehicle, or or it could also be uh, I don't know uh, the the pavement, right? So a big problem with this kind of method that generates uh, uh, image patch to represent the concept that the model has learned is that it requires, okay, first of all, a lot of uh, uh, effort to make sense of the of the output, right? And on the other hand, it doesn't really allow us to get a global understanding of what the model uh, really learns because what we get is just those, you know, uh, uh, separated image patches, and you can imagine that in a data set like ImageNet, right, that contains millions of images, how many uh, image patches we are going to get in the end, right? This is not consumable for, for uh, developers or for users. Um, other than those problems, there are also uh, uh, other problems as well. One problem that we find through our experiment, through our empirical uh, exploration is that uh, not all the concepts that the model use are actually captured by those explainability methods. This I will show you more uh, uh, in, the, in the experimental part. And very importantly, those methods they do not really give an indication on potential, on the relevance of potential combinations of concepts that the model relies on in making predictions. Here, when I'm talking about combinations of concepts, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about rules. Huh? So, um, for example, the explanation might highlight that, okay, the model looks at flashlight, cross logo uh, to recognize an uh, ambulance, but we don't know if it uses them together, right? Or it, or it looks at them uh, uh, individually, for example. Uh, uh, and this could be problematic. For example, we don't really know whether or not we should trust the model if it looks only at the, uh, uh, for example, the, 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 the tier or tire, the tier, <laughs> to say the vehicle is as is, is ambulance, right? Or only look at the, the, the cross sign. Huh? This could still be uh, ambiguous in, uh, in certain cases. So, um, 
before I introduce our method, I want to uh, make it um, uh, very clear uh, for us that well, what do we really want in a good explanation method? So the first, so we're now talking about the requirements of uh, of uh, uh, explanation, right? What makes a good explanation? So the first thing that uh, that we need to uh, think about is, of course, the intelligibility, right? Because in the end, we want humans to be able to understand all those uh, all those uh, uh, explanations. Um, so what we did is that we uh, searched in the literature outside computer science for uh, for insights about intelligibility, and we identified two relevant theories. One is is called the representational theory of of mind, uh, which basically says explains how human minds uh, represent and reason about the, the about our environment, right? And the other is uh, works on uh, uh, human visual processing systems that study how people uh, process visually uh, our environment information from our environment right so important things that we learned are that first humans understand the environment through a concept that corresponds to entities that come with you know and types and attributes for example when we're thinking about an ambulance uh, we might think about the flashlight the cross logo and etc right and additionally we might also think about attributes of those uh, of those uh, uh, entities for example the flashlight is typically orange or white right and those stripes for example on the on the ambulance are typically yellow or blue eh? note that when i was describing those attributes i was were i was using the word typically right which is in fact a important concept uh, uh, by itself uh, that denotes the strength of the association between the between the entity type and the attributes, right? For example, the stripes on the ambulance is more likely to be blue than red, right? There's a relative uh, strength of uh, of this uh, uh, association between the property and and the entity, right? So another thing that we learned is that concepts might be composed themselves of other entities. Uh, for example, uh, 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 the wheels, uh, they have spokes, right? Which by itself is also a concept. Uh, um, and then it can be further broken down into, for example, the shape, a color, texture, etc. Right. So, in fact, human brains uh, will process uh, visual information. Also, uh, uh, well, we process it in a way that goes from the low level uh, concept to the high level, high level ones. For example, we, uh, uh, for example, from uh, color, uh, contrast to shapes, texture, and to more abstract semantic representations of, uh, of a concept, right? So combinations of concepts can be represented through uh, through all different logical operations like and, or, right, which we have actually already talked about. For example, flashlights are usually orange or white, right? Note that the combinations of concepts is really important. It's very important for us humans to understand complex objects. Yeah? And that is something that we want also to see uh, in a machine learning model. Um, a second uh, requirement of, uh, of good explanation that we have, uh, well, actually this is something that people have uh, all recognized, but in the specific context of, uh, uh, of uh, computer vision, this might come with this uh, distinct uh, uh, meaning. So, um, so what we want uh, for a explanation to be very faithful uh, is that we want to know about the ones that the model about the all those concepts right the model really looks at in making predictions and not anything extra not anything more than that right here for example in the in this uh, uh, example ambulance or, or movie vans uh, classification right in this example um, Let's say the model might not have uh, learned to look at the wheels, right? Since they are present in both types of classes. And in this case, we wouldn't want the wheels to appear in our explanation. But if the model is looking at things like the drivers or the sky, right? In the in the detection of vehicles, which are biases, uh, by the way, which are biases. Uh, we don't want the model to learn about this. But if, if indeed the model learns uh, about those concepts in making the decision, we want all those different concepts to be exposed in the explanation, right? Um, and as the last requirement, um, well, 
this is usually uh, uh, ignored in a lot of those uh, uh, a lot of those uh, uh, explainable AI uh, work. Uh, so the requirement here is that we want an explanation to support the different types of interactions from the stakeholders. You know, all those these different stakeholders, it come with a purpose, they come with a goal, right? To debug the model, to whether or not, to decide whether or not to uh, uh, deploy the model or, or trust the model, uh, things like this, right? So uh, then, uh, so broadly, there are two types of uh, interactions uh, 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 that we are interested in. One is the uh, for the purpose of uh, exploration, and the other is for uh, validation, right, on a more abstract level. Uh, so uh, explore exploration means that the users might simply want to explore what model has learned to see if there are anything interesting, right? But they might also have some specific concept or requirements in mind already, right? And they, they they should be able to query whether or not the model follows this uh, this kind of expectations that users have in mind, right? This is another type of uh, interaction uh, validation, right? To validate model behaviors against those uh, those uh, requirements, those expectations, mm -hmm. um, and for this in this scenario, a particularly relevant type of user queries that they may have uh, in this kind of validation activity is, is, is multi-concept queries, queries that involves multiple concepts. For example, the, the user might be uh, interested in uh, finding out whether or not the model uh, does look at flashlights across logo and not the sky uh, in making the predictions, right? So here you can see the combinations of those different concepts in user queries, right? And we should be able, for a good explanation method, we should be able to support these kind of queries. So, and this is what we did uh, well, in our paper. So, um, explanations generated by our um, method can support both the model behavior exploration and validation. And in particular, our interpretation allows uh, to answer those multi-concept uh, queries, such as, okay, if the model relies on cross signs, the flashlight, right, or blue sky eh, for the classification of a vehicle. Um, uh, so here I give some examples, right? These are uh, uh, explanations generated by our model for exploration purposes. Uh, you can see all those different uh, uh, rules that is uh, uh, identified by our method that the model follows in making predictions. Uh, what I didn't, what I, did, I don't show here is the typicality scores. Eh? So, uh, there, there should also be those typicality scores associated to those uh, different rules indicating how much, uh, how strong the model relies on certain rules in making predictions. And then on the left hand, you can see those, uh, 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 well, all those, uh, 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 well, same kind of rules, but then they support the, uh, uh, support the generation of answers to you, those queries, right? So users can get immediately all those uh, 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 response about whether or not the model does follow a certain rule that the user have in mind, right? And um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how it works very briefly, also, uh, uh, also given the limit of the time. <laughs> um, so what I want to 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 uh, well conclude a little bit at this part is that uh, our our method is uh, by design, right? It it uh, it can be very easily uh, so those explanations can be very easily understood by uh, by humans by human users, and it supports the multi-concept validation and exploration. And then for for the other requirements about fidelity, right? That I will show uh, some. Uh, quick experiment without. So how our method works? I'm going to uh, go through this very quickly. So let's say our problem setting uh, is that, uh, uh, let's say we have some models that needs to be uh, interpreted, and then we have a data set, right? In this case, we consider again the, the, the division task where we have a data set of images. Uh, what we do, first we apply some uh, existing local interpretability methods that you know, highlight those uh, pixels in the image that are relevant for the model's prediction, right? Uh, there are some limitations that we need to address here and there when applying this method, but um, let's say uh, we get a, a, a this kind of saliency map, right? Um, and then 
what we do next is that uh, well, we crowdsource the task of making sense of those image patches and the images, right, to a, uh, a large amount of workers online. Huh? Why, why, you know, if you're familiar with concept of crowdsourcing, you should be able to know that uh, you, you should know that all these kind of tasks, right, uh, can be done in a very uh, efficient manner. So uh, we can uh, uh, very quickly get to the the uh, results from a huge number of participants online using crowdsourcing. And what they would provide us is, well, all those things that we have talked about, right? All those entity names and attributes associated to those names that can describe those highlighted areas in the image, right? So this is what we get from the from humans, right? From by involving the humans in the group. Hmm? And then what we're going to do next is simply, you know, we reorganize all those annotations from the from humans in a table, for example, right? Where in each row we have the we have individual image, and then we have all those concepts uh, uh, that that uh, uh, humans as uh, uh, deem as relevant of uh, uh, for the machine's prediction, right? And then what we can do next is well, we apply some. Uh, uh, statistical analysis tools, right? For example, association rule mining yeah? uh, to find out, okay, what are the combinations of those uh, those uh, uh, concepts that uh, that can explain model behavior, right? And maybe also other uh, analysis tools as well. For example, all those visualization tools, all those uh, uh, decision trees, yeah? and then we can well once this is ready, we can you know support all the all the uh, needs of model validation or exploration from the from the uh, users. So this is a workflow. Uh, essentially, it's I mean, it's well, it's not that complex. Essentially, what it does is we're involving humans in the middle so that what we get right is uh, uh, about uh, how the model behaves, right? What we get about how the model behaves is something that is readily consumable by humans, by human users, right? So uh, um, I'm going to very quickly uh, give a few uh, uh, results uh, uh, about our about our uh, about our uh, method. So uh, one thing that I want to to show is that uh, uh, well, our model, oh, no, sorry, our uh, interpretability method gives explanations that has that is not not only that not only can accurately uh, describe what the model actually has learned. Right, but also it can provide us with uh, with uh, a good coverage of all those uh, concepts rule that the model has learned that can eh, that can give us uh, uh, that can further give us some insights about okay whether or not the model has learned something that we don't expect right all those different kind of biases eh, that can help us to identify okay how much we we can trust the model right mm. uh, there is one although there is one uh, uh, particular challenge that we need to address first if we want to evaluate explanations, uh, which is that uh, what well, we don't really know, right, what the model learns. If you think about it, right, we cannot really know what the model have has actually learned, right? It's 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 relatively hard. Huh? So um, and also this is also because uh, well it's it's some common challenge also shared by any other uh, explain explainability methods right previous work what they would do is simply to train a model and manually check for a few very obvious concepts right uh, that they would expect the model to learn if the if the model has really learned that right instead what we did in this work is is coming up with a more extensive uh, uh, test suite a benchmark Right. So what we did was uh, uh, was the following. So we look at the different data, several different data sets, uh, image uh, classification data sets, uh, classifying pedestrian uh, fish and vehicles, right? This uh, uh, common objects that we encounter uh, in our daily life. And then for each of them, we create synthetic uh, biases in the data that should skill the model's mechanisms. So we do this by uh, several different ways. One is that we inject some visual entities into the image, for example, adding timestamps right to the image uh, uh, to the images. And this is this is something not unnatural because if you think about it, right, a lot of images that we take have timestamp there, right, indicating uh, what time 
the image was uh, the picture was taken, right? And uh, the other uh, 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 method that we use is to resample the data set based on uh, uh, some existing entities, right? For example, uh, in this pedestrian uh, gender classification uh, task, what we did is that we only keep those images with uh, uh, with a woman inside, uh, and only those uh, images where the woman has have uh, long hair. Right. So in this, by doing this, we skew the data set such that we can be relatively sure about the fact that the model will pick up this uh, long hair as a bias in recognizing uh, uh, the gender. Right. And we did the same for other. And we did the same for other uh, uh, classes as well. For example, uh, all lobsters are on the plate. Right. We remove all different other lobsters that is not on the plate, and we expect that the model will pick up this plate as a background bias. Right. Um, yeah. And then we also use different uh, uh, tests with different machine learning models that we already know that they have slightly different mechanisms learned. For example, those free train model and those model fine tuned. Right. And then and then we want to know to observe whether or not the explanation really uh, reflect those different uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, OK. I'm going to skip some slides and by the way if you're interested in this uh, uh, benchmark uh, here here is a link to our uh, uh, maybe i should post that as well in the chat i will do that uh, after the presentation so uh, you can go to this website uh, uh, where we host all the data set and uh, other uh, resources that we use in this uh, in this study um okay some quick uh, uh, result um so Sorry, Gia. Uh, On very quick slide. Note. Gia? Yeah. Very quick note. We are uh, basically out of time, so uh, we have to be prepared that people leave already now because some people have meetings at two. So if you could quickly yeah. wrap up, perhaps, that would be great. Yes, the, this will be the last slide. So very quickly, yeah. So uh, we first show uh, some without about a pre-trained model on uh, ImageNet. Uh, and retrieve the global explanations for uh, for three different classes, right? So here on the slide, you can see those images that comes with those highlighted pixels, right? And this is what we get from our uh, explanation, right? Very rich uh, set of concepts that describe what the, what the model has learned. Yeah? And then here is a state of that the baseline that um, by comparison, you can see that uh, this method only gives us uh, uh, those colors, right? It's not really informative about what the model has learned. Uh, and then after we inject those uh, synthetic biases and and fine tuning the model on this uh, uh, on the on the on those uh, biased data set, uh, here you can see that our approach would allow us to obtain those uh, spurious uh, uh, background biases, right? That model has uh, has captured in the prediction. For example, the blue water. Right. Also, the face of the people in recognizing uh, lobsters, right, which shouldn't be there. Uh, and by contrast, the other method reflect much less of those uh, background biases. So, in conclusion, uh, our method identifies uh, more concepts and allows to effectively effectively uncover mechanisms with undesired biases. All right, there are more without, but I will simply skip that. Um, some takeaway messages uh, where I have talked all about them. So basically the one takeaway message would be that if we can uh, actively involve humans in the process of explanation, then what we are going to get in the end uh, about this explanation uh, would be that we would get better explanation that are more consumable by humans, and not only that, but also those explanations that would allow us as humans to uh, identify all kinds of uh, things that we are interested in about about what the model has learned. Yeah. And uh, well, this is just a starting point. We're doing a bunch of uh, other works uh, uh, along this line. And uh, if you're interested, uh, please get in touch. Thank you. That'll be the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Jia. That was a very great talk. Uh, so yeah, as I said, we're basically out of time. So perhaps if there is one burning question, we can take that. And if not, please feel free to contact Gia in person. No questions? Okay, great. 
then uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending and thank you GA for presenting. See you next week thank you. at our Agora meeting. Thank you.